The story of MGS begins in the aftermath of the First World War. A new international body came into being called the League of Nations. But that was only the public version of what, in the Metal Gear Solid universe, was happening off screen. Early in the 20th century, the true holders of power in the United States, the Republic of China, and the newly formed Soviet Union gathered together in a secret meeting. The so-called Wise Men's Committee refers to a secret pact at the time between three up-and-coming world powers, the Soviet Union, the Republic of China, and the United States of America. By pulling together their powers and resources, these three nations formed a new secret society dedicated to securing control and order over the world by any means necessary. This secret committee would soon be known as the Philosophers. 1922. The wife of one of the founding members of the Philosophers has just given birth to a brand new baby girl. Her name is Joy, and she's arguably the most important character in the lore of Metal Gear Solid. For most of Joy's childhood, she lives happily and safely. But following the Great Depression, as well as the inevitable passage of time, by the 1930s, the philosophers are in disarray. The last of the original members died in the 1930s. After that, the organization began to run out of control, and the Wise Men's Committee degenerated into a mere shell of its former self. The philosophers, now phantoms of their former selves, have by the mid-1930s become integrated into every facet of both sides of every conflict in the world. The philosophers of today have no sense of good or evil. Their influence extends to countries and organizations involved in every aspect of every war. They have become war itself. That's how they operate. The sacrifices of war cause a shift in the times. This shift leads to renewed conflict and in turn triggers the next war. Like a nuclear chain reaction, each conflict sparks countless others, forming an endless spiral that will continue on for eternity. The philosophers intend to keep that cycle going forever. When Joy's father reveals all this to her, he is soon thereafter assassinated by the philosophers. And Joy is subsequently abducted trained, and eventually forced into running one of the committee's many spy or so-called charm schools in the United States during the 1930s. Flash forward to 1941. The same year as the attack on Pearl Harbor, Joy is reassigned by the philosophers overseas. The American and British governments and militaries are slowly entering into what Winston Churchill will later call the special relationship. As part of this special relationship, Joy is now to assist in the creation and the operations of an extraordinary new paramilitary unit. The North African campaign of World War II began in 1940. It was a conflict fought by foreign armies on both sides, stretched across huge expanses of arid desert. Traveling to Northern Africa in 1941, Joy is introduced to two British officers there who have a very exciting idea of how best to conduct war in such surroundings. These men are Colonel David Sterling and Major David O. With Joy, these three commandos will create the single most iconic Special Forces unit in history, the SAS. Joy will lead the earliest SAS recruits through the most insane part of the training necessary for the kind of tactics that the SAS was created to accomplish parachuting deep behind enemy lines and surviving off the floor and fauna for extended lengths of time. Joy takes her job of training the SAS seriously. Her time heading one of the philosopher's charm schools, combined with Joy's motherly personality, makes her the perfect kind of mentor and instructor, while her courage, finesse, and raw power on the battlefield makes Joy more than cut out for leading and commanding a unit of roughnecks as balls to the wall as the SAS. In fact, during this time, Joy specifically develops, while deployed in Northern Africa and the Mediterranean, a bold and unconventional new form of silent, non-lethal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Joy will later call the exercises that call for such a unique approach snatcher missions, because often she and her unit were tasked with grabbing key German and Italian personnel for interrogation, as well as sabotage missions that weren't supposed to involve premature pyrotechnics or a high body count. 
For all of these reasons and more, the SAS motto, Who Dares Wins, is supposedly in tribute to her innovative legacy. By the end of Joy's time with the SAS, she was starting to be known as simply the boss. The boss is already becoming an icon of the Special Forces Revolution in military affairs, the poster woman for a new age of conflict. But by early 1943, the boss had done about all she could in the desert for the British Special Forces. The philosophers now have a much more important focus. During the last great war, the most powerful men in America, China, and the Soviet Union had a secret pact. The pact was a blueprint for defeating the Axis powers and creating a new world order. To secure victory in the war, the three countries pooled their resources to conduct the most covert types of operations and research. This cache of funds they then began to call the Philosopher's Legacy. First off, they began using the legacy to accelerate research and development across every viable field, every related field of study. Control over all battlefields also entailed that when the philosophers moved against you, it would be with secret weapons and revolutionary new techniques that you'd never see coming. The philosophers developed a new MO, total information control. In Stalin's Soviet Union, for example, whole cities were converted into top secret, so-called experimental design bureaus. In these so-called OKB Sharashkas, scientists and engineers from all over the Soviet Union were taken prisoner there in these secret camps and forced to slave over advanced research projects for the state. This so-called prison science network kept Soviet secrets hidden while keeping its scientists repressed. Meanwhile, in America, the philosophers enlisted the help of the Navajo language to create a virtually unbreakable naval cipher against the Japanese. They also conducted a highly secretive yet incredibly massive operation to create and test the first atomic weapons in history. The so-called Manhattan Project not only required creating a literal mini-state within the American state to handle every aspect of development in total secrecy, it also relied on direct help from a colonized minority ethnic group, the Angolese, living in the region of the world's most potent natural source of uranium, Shinkalogwe Mine. But development of the atomic bomb jump-started the advent of information systems technology as well. The same devices and machines that were being pioneered in the 1940s to carry out the requisite calculations for the Manhattan Project were just as well suited for other kinds of large data sets and numerical or statistical computations. Say, for example, the kind of computations that would soon be the foundation for a new kind of science called genetic engineering. Some of the earliest experiments in 20th century genetics often used flies and other smaller size organisms with rapid birth death rates so that changes would occur much faster and more observably over a shorter period of time. This meant that many, if not most, of the 20th century's pioneers within genetics had extensive first-hand experience with the cultivation of and with the experimentation with viruses, pathogens, microbes, and parasites. It's not clear precisely how, but it was precisely this early research into genetic fundamentals that led the philosophers to create the COBRA unit, a new highly secretive commando unit led by the boss herself, who would now be known as the Joy. Each of the COBRAs were named for the emotions they carried into battle, or at least that's what the public was told. But in reality, each member of the mixed Soviet American elite unit was secretly utilizing various strains of mysterious and powerful parasites. The Nazis in Stalingrad didn't know what hit them, and neither did the world. The Cobras were like the SAS all over again, except this time they were destined not for fame, but for infamy and for sorrow. By the year 1943, the boss and her Soviet compatriots and the Cobras were a tight-knit family. She was even romantically involved with one of her comrades, the shadow warrior known as the Sorrow. But despite all that, the Soviets, the Soviet philosophers, were beginning to realize the Cobras could make for a potentially major problem for them in the era to come in the wake of the war. Who would the Cobras follow in that time? Their nation, the Soviet Union, or their boss? The Soviet philosophers assumed the latter and decided to sabotage the Cobras and the boss before either of them became a real threat. Word came in that the famed scientist John von Neumann was, in reality, working covertly as a Nazi spy. As the Cobras set out to carry out an assassination in Los Alamos, 
the boss learned something life-altering along the way. She had become pregnant. What would become of her child with the sorrow? Would it too be snatched like joy had been by the philosophers once she outlived her usefulness? And how, for that matter, could Newman be a Nazi? It just didn't make sense. It was because of all this was swirling around inside Joy's head, as the Cobras infiltrated Los Alamos, that in a rare lapse of judgment, Joy took her mind off the mission. That, in her line of work, is all it takes. When she found a gun barrel firing directly in the direction of her womb, the boss dove down to absorb the hit. The head wound put her out of commission for six months. In June of 1944, the Cobras and I took part in the landing at Normandy. We'd been given a top secret mission to locate and destroy enemy V-2 rocket installations. I was pregnant at the time. The sorrow was the father. I gave birth on the field of battle. A beautiful baby boy. But my child was snatched away from me by the philosophers. After World War II, the philosophers essentially split apart, with each original founding nation retreating to become post-war rivals. Though the Soviet and American factions had different ideologies, both sides benefited from the emerging paradigm of the Cold War. It made both regimes harder to resist and to question, and their state of potentially indefinite conflict kept their status quo in balance. Only one figure truly represented a threat to either superpower's agenda, the boss. Her power was as a symbol, and hers was a symbol that transcended borders or ideologies. The boss's legend had the potential to take on a life of its own, and something like that couldn't be predicted or controlled in its effects on the public mind. So the American philosophers concocted a plan they would spend the next decade systematically dismantling the boss's autonomy, her legacy, and her life. The philosophers would raise a replacement, an icon of warfare, with the power to stir whole nations like the boss, except this time it would be, by design, a power and a person entirely under the control of the philosophers. November 1st, 1951, the Nevada Desert. It's been four years since the Cobra unit disbanded, and six since the birth of Joy's child on the beaches of Normandy. It's here, as a subject of atomic testing, that Joy is exposed to critical levels of radiation and left infertile as a result. No longer able to bear children of her own, the boss finds solace in training her own replacement, a fellow atomic test subject, the 15-year-old Jack. Together, Joy and Jack build off her innovations during Joy's tenure at the SAS to create, during the 1950s, a new unarmed combat technique called CQC. Meanwhile, Joy also invented a revolutionary parachute deployment method before she was tasked with teaching the so-called high-altitude, low-opening jump technique to the next generation of American Special Forces at the Special Ops Training Camp located in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Unfortunately, what Joy's new protege Jack didn't realize at this time was that his mentor was still heavily involved in the underworld of international espionage. The boss had cultivated a large network of sources and cutouts throughout the Soviet Union during the war. There, she was still fondly remembered for her role in beating back the Nazis out of Stalingrad with the nickname Voyevoda. In 1957, the Soviets launched the first satellite ever into space. Following this embarrassing debacle, the boss began to reach out to her Soviet contacts after a decade of silence. As a result, Joy learned about several key Soviet personnel who were dissatisfied with Stalin's replacement, Khrushchev. She believed that these connects could help with everything from espionage to sabotage to counterintelligence. Despite the boss's initiative, her higher-ups at Langley wanted no part in collaborating with communist Soviets without better leverage and when the boss overruled the CIA by installing a sleeper agent, they wound up claiming it was their idea all along, when the news broke to the president. Mainly, the CIA wanted no part of restoring the boss to her former glory. For a time, her sleeper agent provided top-notch intel, but only after infiltrating on her own, the Soviet Research Design Bureau, OKB-1, 
does the boss discover that our inside man had in fact defected at some point back to the side of the Soviets. But there was even bigger and worse news. This time it was about the new Soviet spacecraft prototype, codenamed Vostok 3KA number 2. What Joy's inside man had left out of his reports was that this craft was designed for re-entry using a human pilot. The Soviets had already humiliated America with Sputnik, the first space satellite, and now, as the U.S. was totally unprepared, the Soviets stood on the very brink of manned spaceflight. This was unacceptable. The CIA blamed all these surprises on the boss to President-elect Kennedy, and there was nobody with the clout to back her up. Now, to make amends for the CIA's malfeasance, Joy would embark upon her most daring mission yet. The boss would be trying to beat the Soviets into space herself in a hastily built knockoff craft that came with a guarantee of further exposure to critical levels of radiation. It was only thanks to Joy's earlier involvement in atomic testing, coupled with her background, that NASA now had a chance to observe the effects of such cosmic exposure for the first time. They readily agreed, and the boss, with no other hope of restoring her own legacy, agreed as well. April 1961. Joy is the first American, the first person, to make it into space. What she sees up there will stay with her for the rest of her days. But tragically, the rushed manufacturing and design leave her re-entry pod with a fatal flaw. Severely burned in the ensuing crash landing, the boss falls into a half-year-long coma as a result. Because of this last-minute yet catastrophic error, the entire achievement gets covered up. History would never remember the missing member of the Mercury 7 project while the Soviets officially beat the U.S. to space with Yuri Gagarin on the Vostok rocket mere days if not hours following Joy's trip. Officially, she had been part of the CIA's Bay of Pigs fiasco during that time, but in reality, the boss, again, couldn't have. She was laying dormant in a coma. 1962. Having recovered from her injuries, the boss is sent back behind enemy lines to retaliate against her former sleeper agent turned traitor and to figure out what went wrong. When she's sent in to assassinate the defector, it's inside a small remote region of the southern half of the USSR called Selinovyarsk. And it's here that Joy uncovers the Soviet operative behind her contact's defection is the father of her long lost child, the sorrow. But one of us had to die. I was left with no choice. The sorrow gave his life for me. There is no enmity between us. One must live and one must die. That was the mission. 